church in Acts. We, I just feel it's so important that we continue just to, yeah, to refresh ourselves in whatever we're facing. Look, the New Testament church, the early church, and down the years, believers have faced far greater challenges. And uh, so it's good for us to catch the, the challenge of that. And last time we looked at the seventh chapter of Acts and we saw how the glory of God was a main concern for the New Testament church. Today I want to move on to Acts chapter 8. And um, honestly, as I look at that chapter, if you've read through the chapter, you might want to turn to the chapter. Some of the verses will come up on the screen, but not all of them. So you might like to flick over to Acts 8 uh, or on your phone or Bible. But as you, if you were to look through Acts 8, it, it's amazing. Scenes change so fast. It's like there's a whole range of things that happen. It moves so quickly, very, very fast. It's like you step out of your kitchen at home, you step through the door, and you turn around, you go back into your kitchen door, and you find you're in the lounge. It's like things have suddenly moved. How did that happen? And you find that in uh, Acts 8, things move so quickly. But as I look at chapter 8, the scenes change quickly, but you can see that there are a few overall themes or truths, all right, uh, that God wants us to know and really lay hold of and draw strength from, especially as one year ends and another year is about to begin. All right, a number of truths. One of these truths or themes, we'll, and we'll unpack them as we go, is this, is that God is sovereign over all things. We don't call the shots, he does, and he operates above and behind all things to achieve his great purposes, not ours. All right, he is God and he is sovereign. Helen brought that word earlier, just about you can't box God, you can't put him in a box. No, he is sovereign. That's the first great theme that you'll see in this chapter. And another is this, that, that, that yes, he is sovereign, and though he's sovereign, we are called to play a part. In fact, we are called to partner with God as he brings about his great purposes. So number one, God is sovereign and working out his plans. And number two, we are called to partner with him. And we can see both of these themes being worked out in chapter eight. And I'm going to pray because I believe these are incredible truths and I don't want to just say some words. I want God by His Spirit to speak them into your soul as we gear up to a new year. So, Lord, I just thank you so much that, Lord, there are a thousand hallelujahs. Lord, as we meet here right now before your throne, there are multitudes worshipping you by sight. Lord, we worship by faith and we're filled with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. I pray, Lord, as we talk about these two issues, your sovereignty and also our partnership with you, would you please breathe on us by your Spirit in Jesus' name. Make it live for us, Lord, I ask. Amen. 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 Excellent. Excellent. Hallelujah. So he is sovereign and working out his plans. Now, even before we get to chapter 8, all right, this is just a biblical fact. And the Paul in Ephesians 1, he says this, that God works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. In other words, God has a purpose and a plan, and he operates above and behind all things to fulfill that plan, and nothing can stop or frustrate him. He is God. Right? That's the first thing. And you can see evidences of that right here at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, which actually begins with the death of Stephen, or Acts 7 ends with the death of Stephen. Stephen is stoned. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says this, that on that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house and drag off women and men and put them in prison. So, so there's no way around it. This is a, a devastating blow for the early church, right? You've got Stephen, this dynamic guy who's moving in such power, suddenly, violently taken out of the picture. And it says his friends mourn deeply for him. And then this sparks off this vicious persecution of the church. 
Saul, later on Paul, our friend Paul, Saul, it says, is ravaging the church. And that's a very strong word. It means to violently tear apart the church. And you've got to think about that in real terms. Because what that means is that families are being split up and kids are losing their parents and people are being put behind bars and they're being beaten and they're being tortured. And so Saul's aim to destroy the church it seems very effective because the church, we read, just scatters. It's like everybody's going, we just got to get out of Jerusalem. And they flee everywhere. They just take off. All, it says, except the apostles who stay in Jerusalem. So however you look at this, this is a huge turnaround for the church. Because up to that point, man, the church has been expanding so fast. We read about thousands getting saved, literally thousands getting saved and coming into the church. And the impact of the church reaching the whole of Jerusalem. So this is huge momentum. And suddenly it's like slam, all right, Stephen is dead, persecution is launched, and everyone scatters. <laughs> And suddenly, I've got this picture of the, the kind of the apostles g gathering again, looking at each other and thinking, what on earth is going on? It's like, what? Can you imagine the first Sunday morning service they had after everybody had scattered, you know? Who's doing the worship? I uh, don't know. No worship team. Uh, who's doing projector? N nobody's on projector this morning. Peter, you have to go on projector. Who's on hospitality? No hospitality this morning. The odd biscuit. Who's on kids' work? Well, there are no kids, so there's no work. It's like, where's everybody gone? And like the whole church has just gone. You know, it, it's funny, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the days after the first lockdown that we had. You know, when as, I remember as elders we met together, looking at each other going, what's going on? Where's the church? It's like, what is happening? And I had people coming up to me saying, Pete, what's going to happen to the church and where's it going? And I remember thinking, I don't know. I don't know. I know before COVID we had momentum, we were pushing forward. Now, not so much. It's like, what's happened? What's happened? Well, here you have the apostles, and it's like, what just happened, God? And where's your church? And I imagine even one or two of them thinking, is that it then? Is it all over? Is the dream gone? Here we are. <laughs> no one's around. It looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? And yet... And yet, well, you can look at what happens next. As a direct result of this disaster in Jerusalem, right, we read in the next verse, verse 4, it says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. In other words, as they scatter, as they flee, they're just sharing the gospel. And in fact, later on, a few chapters on from here, we read that these same believers, they scattered up the coast. All right, up through Phoenicia, and then Cyprus, and then Antioch, sharing the gospel as they go. And it says, the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And in fact, later on, a mighty church is planted in Antioch as a result. You know, the church that becomes the launch pad of this amazing church planting movement across the world. So it's amazing. Instead of the church being shut down and destroyed, actually the opposite happens. It's like the whole thing just takes off exponentially and surprisingly. It's like I imagine taking a bucket full of, I don't know, red hot ash on the top of a hillside in a windy day and just throwing it in the air and all the ash just scatters and every spark that falls starts a fire on its own. The whole thing just takes off. Amazing. That's kind of what's happening here. And in fact, right here in chapter 8, right in the next verses, we read that <laughs> Philip, as part of that scattering, goes down to Samaria and preaches the gospel there. And it says this, it says, it says, with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And then it says, and I love this little phrase, there was great joy in the city. And suddenly we're aware again, aren't we, that God is about something far bigger than the understanding of those on the ground, aren't we? I mean, they see or may see destruction 
and grief and confusion and setback and disappointment and failure, but actually it's huge expansion. That's actually what's going on. And as we said earlier, God is sovereign over all things. We don't call the shots, he does. And he operates above and behind all things to achieve his great purposes and not ours. God is sovereign and he was about a bigger thing than just building a church in Jerusalem. Yeah? He has a greater plan. And actually, the clues were always there because way back in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, but, but not just Jerusalem. Also in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was always God's plan. And some, some scholars even argue that possibly the apostles' picture was a little too small, a little bit too Jerusalem-centric. And God had to shake the tree and scatter the fruit. <laughs> and that's why persecution came. Either way, God is about a greater thing. And the takeaway is obvious, isn't it? As it was for the early apostles, so it is often with you and me. All right? The fact is, you do not know all that God is doing in your life. In fact, if you think about it, you can't know everything. Your perspective is too small. It reminds me, a few weeks ago, I wanted to take my cat to the vet. Yes, for his annual jab, his flu jab and to be checked over, which is what they do these days to cats. I didn't know that. We inherited this cat. We didn't choose him. We have a cat, have to look after him, has to go to the vet to get his flu jab and to be checked over. So there I am trying to stuff our cat into this travel cage. And, and, I, and it was a real effort. He's screaming, he's shrieking, he's clawing me, he's scratching. Now, I could have just said, stop, stop, stop. I could have just put him into a little armchair somewhere and said, let me explain to you, all right? I am taking you to the vet for your good. It is for you. There is a bigger story here. I don't think it would make any difference at all. Why? Because he just doesn't have the capacity to see the bigger picture. He just doesn't. Well, in a funny kind of way, that's a little bit like it is for us, or often with us. We just don't have the scale and scope to take in all that God is doing in and around us. We don't. He knows where he's taking us. He knows what we have to go through to get there. Often we don't. But, but and, and this is real important, that doesn't mean that there aren't certain things that we can trust in, even when we don't know, and things that the early apostles also could trust in and believe. For instance, the fact is that God does have a plan that he's determined to accomplish. One of my favorite declarations is Habakkuk 2.14, which is, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. That is the declared, set purpose of our sovereign God. That's where history is going. Whatever is going on in the world around us, this is where we're going. Or as Paul puts it in Ephesians 1, he says that God's plan is to bring everything together under the headship of Christ. That's where it's going. Everything will submit to Jesus. One day that will happen. And we even get a glimpse of what that looks like later in the New Testament when John sees what's going to happen. And in Revelation 21, he says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That is where we are going. That's where all history is going, under the hand of our sovereign God. Whatever else may be going on in the world, listen, as 2022 draws to a close, and COVID cases are on the rise, and interest rates are on the rise, and the world seems more vulnerable than ever, and global warming is on the rise. Look, this is still the plan, and this is what we can trust, whatever else is going on. And, and here's one other thing as well, right? 
And please hear this. As, as great as that plan is, it's a plan that includes you and me in the most intimate and personal way. This is another reason why I so love God. He's not, he's not just transcendent, eternally above all, a great plan for the world. No, he's also intimate and so personal and sovereignly involved in every detail of your life. He is. I, I just treasure the 139th Psalm. I love it. I was just reading again earlier today in my prayer time, just reading it through this amazing declaration of how God knows me. Just walking through some of it. Lord, you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Well, that's not judgment. That's not have you performed today. That is love. You are known by God. As we heard earlier, you are loved. Understand, you are loved. We are loved by a sovereign God. Before a word is on my tongue, <clears throat> you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. It's like God encircles me with his love. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. How much more intimate can you get? This is God knitting us together, knowing us from before we were born. And finally, your eyes saw my unformed substance in other versions. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Just, just ponder that for a moment. He's the grand author of your life. You are his book. And you don't know what the next chapter holds or how many chapters you have. But he does. And here's a story to tell through your life. And he writes every page with his own hand. And it's a story that will be for his glory and for your good. That is the truth. These are the things we do understand and can trust. So, yes, God is sovereign Lord over all things. We don't call the shots, he does. And he operates above and behind all things to achieve his great purposes, not ours. I mean, if you think about it, that's what the Christmas story is all about. You know, this vulnerable baby. Jesus comes as, as this vulnerable little baby. Think about that. Born in a stinking stable, born in the backwoods of the Roman Empire, born to a very ordinary, nondescript young couple. That this baby should actually be God the Son. Who would have guessed? You know, the one who, through whom all, him all things were made. The one who sustains all things. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind, the saviour of the world. And I reckon that most of those who heard him crying that night in that stable didn't have a clue. Just didn't know. Only the sovereign God fully knew that one day this baby would grow up and die shamefully on a Roman cross. And at that time it seemed like a terrible disaster. Terrible failure. The apostles or disciples again scattered. But actually it was the mightiest rescue plan in all of history. Sin dealt with. The devil disempowered. And mankind reconciled to God. God alone fully knew what was going on. Hallelujah. Guys, as we finish one confusing, challenging year, we don't know what the next year will hold for us or for our church, but one thing we do know, he is sovereign. He calls the shots, and he operates above and behind all things to achieve his great purposes. And oh, and by the way, of the increase of his government and peace, there is no end. Even the increase of it doesn't end. It continues to grow and expand. And that's the first great theme or truth of this chapter in chapter 8. That's what you see. And then the second is this, and I'll just mention this briefly, don't worry. But, but in the light of all that I've said about his sovereignty, how do we respond then? What do we do? 
We do as we go home in our cars today. What do we do? Well, one thing we're told to do, we're told to partner with God on his terms. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means several things, actually, but, but one of the things highlighted here in Acts 8 is this. We are to partner with God by being filled with his Holy Spirit. Filled with his Spirit. And this is taught throughout the book of Acts, but you can catch the urgency of it here in chapter 8. Really urgent. You see that in chapter 4. It says this, Philip, he goes down to Samaria, he preaches, proclaims the gospel. Then it says in verse 12 that, that when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, women and men. And it's astonishing, you're talking about hundreds then being wonderfully saved. And then word of what's going on drifts back to the apostles back in Jerusalem about what has happened. And so you get verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They'd simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Wow, so, so the apostles back in Jerusalem hear what's going on in Samaria. They responded to the gospel and their response immediately is, we need to get up there then. ASAP, something needs to happen up there. It's not over yet. In other words, this is important. We need to make sure they've also received the Spirit. This is urgent. And that's in line with the urgency of the book of Acts up to that point. I mean, what did Jesus say back in chapter 1? He says this, verse 4, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. In a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In other words, this is important. Don't go without it. Don't, don't carry on without this gift of the Spirit. You say, well, why is it so important? Well, in verse 8, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, don't miss this. You need this. You need to be filled with the Spirit. Look, if you want to actively partner with God, it's like he's saying, you can't do it in your own strength. You'll need mine. You'll need mine. Our partnership with God is through the Holy Spirit. Now, am I saying that if you're not filled with the Spirit, you're not saved or anything like that? Well, of course I'm not. Not at all. We've already seen that the Samaritans have responded to the gospel. They were baptized. You can't do that without a work of the Spirit. You can't be born again without a deep work of the Spirit. So if you're a Christian, then let's be really clear, the Spirit of God is within you. Absolutely. But, it's just more. That's not the end. There's more. It's not just that God has a plan and we just have to find our way through it. No, he has a plan and he wants to empower us to walk in it. That's the partnering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He wants to empower us to walk in it. So there is more, more power, more presence more life. So please don't miss this. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to walk out the plans of God. God has given us the promise of the Spirit to that end. So don't miss this. The invitation is to partner with God through His Spirit. And this is why we love every opportunity, don't we, to receive the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit and to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you can be today. You can be today. And most of you know my story. I won't bore you with the whole thing again. I've told it many times, how the Spirit of God came upon me and changed my life. And that's my testimony. He did. How as a young man, I was the guy who was too shy and too anxious <laughs> to say anything to anyone, literally physically unable to stammer so constricting I couldn't speak I was the guy who used to turn up in church and I'd put the chairs out and I'd go home again didn't want to talk to anybody couldn't there were times I couldn't do it <laughs> and, the, and I remember carrying such anger and frustration 
And uh, if you don't have that issue, you won't really know what I'm talking about. The terrible frustration of not being able to speak and yet feeling such things inside and wanting to but being unable. Until when I was 16 years old, I remember this passing guy, prophetic guy, walked in, put his hand on my head and said, you will teach and preach publicly. And I still remember the gasp around the room <laughs> and almost the chuckle of the cynical, you've got to be joking. And I remember thinking, you've got to be joking. And then the Spirit of God came to me and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit not long after. And God gave me a tongue, English as well as another one. And God empowered me. Now that wasn't the whole story. There was more to be done because even as a young pastor, I still struggled at times to preach. But actually, the biggest struggle wasn't with my speech so much as the realization that I didn't like people. <laughs> Maybe it's the way I grew up, not being able to speak. I, I didn't, I, didn't I, I wanted to be on my own. Give me a library somewhere where I could study. I didn't, I didn't like people. Um, this is my job. How, how do I get out of this? I prayed that many times until I still remember walking into the back of a meeting like this one and just there at the back just put my hands up and began to worship and I still remember this amazing encounter with the Spirit of God he came and baptized me afresh it was like a big bucket of oil I remember it so clearly just being poured out over my head and just flooded me and then oh some time later when I finally got up off the floor I remember thinking, what was that? And I didn't actually know immediately. Except that as the weeks went by, I suddenly realized, I really love the folks. <laughs> and I think what happened was simply was this, that I understood his love for me. And it released me to love others in a way that I'd never done. And that would be my testimony. He came and filled me and empowered me then to walk out the plan that he had for me. So I stand here as a miracle before you. <laughs> this is God. This is God. It is the Lord. Funny, I tell that story so often. You still, you still clap at the right moment. Thank you. But it's true. I love it. This is why, don't tell me that you can't receive more of the Spirit. Oh, no. And don't tell me that it's not for power. And it's not to empower you to fulfill your calling. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is power. Hallelujah. Guys, we are saying goodbye to one tough year and who knows what the next one will hold. As Lawrence was saying, look, you run with, haven't run with men. How are you going to run with horses? <laughs> I hear the galloping of horses. We need his power for this, don't we? Don't try and do it in your own strength. It'll wear you out. It'll burn you out. Occasionally I get people say to me, how come you're still in ministry after 35 years or whatever it is? And I think, well, I guess it must be God. <laughs> he empowers us. We need his power. Hallelujah. Saying goodbye to one year, saying hello to the next. Two things we can be absolutely sure of. Number one, God is sovereign. We don't call the shots. He does. He operates above and behind all things to achieve his purpose and he invites us to partner with him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so I'm very aware there may be some here this morning and look, you're not thinking, I wonder what next year will hold. You're thinking, how will I survive this one still? And there may well be one or two of you thinking, well, you don't know what I'm facing at home now. You don't know what's, what I've left back there. You don't know the trauma we're facing in our family or in my marriage or in my workplace, or even in my sense of call that I thought I had, but don't seem to have right now. If that's you, then here's an opportunity once again to receive the Spirit. You need God. There's no fix it for you. There's no seminar. No, you just need the Lord. Oh, you may have other things too that will help, but don't miss this thing. You need God. And actually, maybe you've been brought to this very place so that you might turn away from your own weak resources and begin to draw on his eternal ones. If you feel poor in spirit, you're in the right place because to them is promised the kingdom of heaven. Shall we stand? Let's just stand.
Hallelujah. I believe God would say to you, I am sovereign. And number two, you need my spirit. Let's just pause for a second, shall we? Hallelujah.